Well, good morning. Uh, you know, a, a few years ago, Pastor Diane and I were just praying and, and seeking God and just asking God what, uh, what he was saying about ministry and, and the church. And we really felt like he told us there were these three themes that he wanted us to really spend our ministry focusing on and make sure that we are pouring energy into these three areas. And so uh, the first is faith. Hopefully you've heard a lot about faith around here. Um, freedom, which we're going to do a, a whole series on freedom coming up here in another month. And the other was family, faith, freedom, and family. And so uh, in, in the month of October, we're going to do a brand new series I'm kicking off this morning called My Functional Family. Everybody say functional. So I looked up that word functional for you, and it says this. It has to do with the way in which something operates. So if it's functional, it's the way something operates. It means it's a special activity that's used to contribute to the development of the larger whole, right? So we say words like functional, but what, what do they really mean? It's something that has to do with the way something operates, but it's a special activity that contributes to the operation or the success or the development of a larger whole. So when we say a functional family, because how many of you have heard of a dysfunctional family? We hear a lot about that. But what makes a family functional, that means what makes it operate properly or what makes it develop as a whole in, in proper fashion because we want to have uh, functional families, not dysfunctional families. And so I know when I say the word family or functional family, it sort of depends on what decade or what era you probably uh, grew up in or probably were influenced from. And so I thought I would just uh, start here. And if you are um, a, a, a little bit old school in, in our more mature crowd, your ID, ideal um, TV family probably looks more like this. Uh, remember Ozzy and Harriet? I hear a few laughs. Some of you are like, what is black and white? Why isn't there any color in those pictures? Uh, I, then I, I think another generation was influenced by the Cleavers. You all y'all remember Leave it to Beaver? Okay. Um, then then I, I think in the 70s, there was the family that sort of fixed everything. I mean, there were fashion icons. They, there was nothing that couldn't be cured in 30 minutes, right, with the Brady Bunch, right? How many, how many film me on the Brady Bunch? All right. Um, obviously, we came out of the Bradys in the 80s. There was the Keatons and, and family ties. And then um, I think everything went south in the uh, 90s with... Uh, With the Bundys. The 2000s, they tried to explain to us what a modern family was like. And in more recent, TV is probably made up of this show, a very emotional show. And so no matter uh, what decade or generation uh, of your TV viewing, it kind of gave us an ideal for what family life was, was all about. But as I was thinking about that, I thought I would open up with this little, little survey. How many of you would say that your family that you grew up in wasn't real functional, but it was the opposite, and it was probably dysfunctional? You, yeah, a lot, lot, lot of hands, a lot of hands in the room. So if I define functional to you, I probably ought to define dysfunctional. Dysfunctional means this, abnormal or impaired functioning. So if we have functioning, which means the development of a better whole, then dysfunction means that our families can be impaired or actually have abnormal functioning. And with this many people, we understand that our families, there is a lot of dysfunction in, in our families. And so there are a lot of hands, and, and there probably might have been a few more hands, but your relatives are here, so you didn't, you didn't want them to see you. Raise your hand. But I was thinking about this statement. It is um, very possible that sometimes we can... We can probably be dysfunctionally functional. Dysfunctionally functional. Functionally, functionally, I'll spit it out here in a minute. Functioning, but really being dysfunctional in our function. That's, that looks really good on my notes, but when I said that out loud. 
You, you know, uh, uh, a few years ago, our staff got involved in a, in a program in our community where if there were snow days in the school system, and it's a sad thing that, that there are a lot of kids in our, in our area, in our demographic, that go without, especially things like food. And so if, the, if school was canceled because of a snow day, a lot of those kids, they were finding out they weren't having meals that day. And so we found out that there was a grant that made food available, and our staff actually got involved. Some of you volunteered, and we actually uh, went to a school, picked up the food in the morning, and distributed that to their homes. Now, they've since created a more efficient system where we don't have to do that. I believe they send food home with the students. Uh, but we would go house to house, and I'm telling you if, you, if you just spend a little time going house to house, it was really, really evident there was a lot of dysfunction in our demographic breakdown in the family but not just breakdown uh, drug abuse um, many times there's small children watching themselves at home um, go to some houses you know they were without heat they were without means and so there, there was a lot of devastation in our culture with families and the breakdown of family is at the root cause of the breakdown of our society and so like everything else I would tell you that I believe the answers are found within the words of, uh, of, of Scripture and so what we want to do in this series is bring out to you some principles that I think will help you make sure that your family is scripturally functional. But I did a little bit of research for you, um, studied some, what some counselors would say, psychologists would say, and I put this together in just a, a list of the difference between a functional family and a dysfunctional family. And so I'll give these to you before I share some points with you. Um, the first difference is provision versus need. Provision versus need. For a functional family, members have all the basic needs that, that they would need and it's provided for them. If you come from a dysfunctional family, your basic needs are actually missing. But functional families have provision. Functional families have security. Dysfunctional families know what fear is really like. So in other words, a functional family feels safe mentally. They feel safe emotionally. They, they feel safe physically. Another difference is affirmation versus rejection. I see you taking notes. The easiest thing, you might just want to take a picture of that screen real quick. A functional family, all family members uh, feel welcome to express love, encouragement, validation to each other. So family members are affirmed. Another difference is respect versus disrespect. Functional families appreciate the ideas. They appreciate the abilities, the boundaries of one another. Dysfunctional families are obviously disrespectful. Functional families have connection. Dysfunctional families know what isolation is all about. In other words, functional families create those happy life moments that they share together, the quality moments they have together. Functional families know how to communicate. Dysfunctional families live in silence. In other words, functional families know how to chat, confront, and converse openly about things. And then lastly, functional families have direction. Dysfunctional families drift. And what I mean by that is functional families have a confident, clear understanding of what they expect as far as conduct goes. And I would like to focus in on that last one where we talk about direction or drifting because there really is a direct correlation between spiritual direction in a family and, and functionality versus dysfunction, meaning the absence of scriptural teaching and scriptural training and biblical training and behavioral conduct that is, that is accurate and, and that is correct. And if you're sitting in here and you're, you're an educator, you're, you're probably understanding because you are left to deal with and have all of those symptoms and responses from the children that you teach, you know, five days a week. But I really want to focus in on that last one about how do we give direction and how do we keep our families from drifting? And, and so it really comes down to us taking responsibility for our families and for the direction of our families. And so some statistics would say this, that one million kids every year watch their parents divorce, over a million kids. Out of those million kids, 70% of our, our young people will be more likely to have academic troubles and be expelled from school. There's 164% more likely that they would give birth of a t as a teenager, 92% more likely to fail in marriage in their future, and 50 to 150% more likely to abuse alcohol and drugs. All has a very direct correlation and connection to how functional 
our families are or how dysfunctional our families are. And so what I want to do this morning for you is use a scripture, and I want to talk about this as our, our title this morning, that I really believe that functional families pursue properly. They pursue properly. Everybody say pursue. They have a proper pursuit of things. Now, we're going to build on this each week. Go with me, if you would, to the book of Joshua. And if you know anything about Joshua, Joshua is one of the greatest leaders in the Bible. And he did what Moses couldn't do. He was able to take all of Israel and bring them out of the wilderness, and he brought them into the promised land. And at the end of Joshua's life, this was his dying speech. And we find this in verse 24. Uh, chapter 24, vor verses 14 and 15. And he said, now, therefore, this is his, his dying words. He said, fear the Lord. Serve him in sincerity and serve him in truth. And put away the gods that your father served on the other side of the river in Egypt. Serve the Lord. Verse 15. And if it seems evil to you to serve the Lord, then choose for yourselves this day whom you're going to serve, whether it's the gods which your father served on the other side of the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land that you are dwelling. But, everybody say but, as for me and as for my house, we're going to serve the Lord. I like the end of that phrase. You choose whether it's right for you who you will serve, but for me and for my house, we're going to what? We're going to serve the Lord. And I believe that's a proclamation. That's a decision and a choice. And it literally, written in Scripture, is written as a choice. This is the choice that we're going to make. And I find in this Scripture, there are some pointers that we can bring out. There are three life points that we can bring out that determines that choice. We're going to serve the Lord. Because as I see families being dysfunctional, falling apart, a culture full of fear... Uh, a demographic full of poverty, a country right now that has no clue how to help a family or society, I would say this to you. This is appropriate today that no matter what they're going to choose, me and my house, me and our church, you and your family, we're all about what? We're going to do it the right way. We're going to do it by the Bible. We're going to do it by Scripture. We're going to serve the Lord. And I wrote this down, and I think this is great. Since it's my birthday, I need a big amen. Don't leave me hanging. Listen to this statement. People are dysfunctional. Dysfunctional. God's not. Did y'all get that? We can be dysfunctional. People can be dysfunctional. But guess what? God's not dysfunctional. That means the Word of God is not dysfunctional. And it means this, that functional families do not happen by accident. It's a choice we make. As for me and my house, as for my life, as for the direction of my life, we're going to serve the Lord. So let's bring out some pointers. We call them life points. Here's the first one. I believe that functional families, under this title that they pursue properly, they pursue God as their top priority. So I would say to you that one of the biggest reasons that your family will be functional or not is what you and your family pursue and how you pursue that. And it all starts with this, that God has to be the top priority in the life of our families. Now, here's the thing about priorities. We all are very quick to throw our priorities out there because usually in our lives, priorities are what we want them to be, but they're not always functioning that way. Like, in other words, I could say God's the highest priority in your life, but sometimes he's not. Because we, we, we say our priorities are by what we want, what we think they should be, what the right answer is, but really, how do you tell what is the priority in your life? It's what's on your calendar, it, it's where your money goes, it's where you spend your time, your talents, and effort. So you can say these things are priority, but it takes us taking responsibility for them and making sure that they are functional, and if we're going to have successful, functional families, then what do we do? We pursue God as the top priority in our life. It, and, and so I thought this word pursue was an interesting word. And I love the definition of the word pursue. It means to chase after what you desire. To chase after what you desire. So if I said to you that the function of your family, the success of your family 
really depends on what you're pursuing. It really comes down to what you're going after. And whatever it is in your life that you want, your desire, your goal, that means you'll pursue it. Which tells me this, there's a prize worth pursuing, there's a person worth pursuing it, and there's a path which, which you go to pursue that on. So if we're going to have these functional, successful families, and I believe the world needs to see that, it comes down to how we pursue it. It's how we chase after what it is that we really want. And the Bible is very clear in verse 14. Joshua said this. He said, the very first thing he said was, therefore, fear the Lord. Now, the word fear here is not the word for intimidation. It's not the word for cringing fear. It's actually the word for awe. A-W-E, awe. I am in awe of God. God has my highest esteem. God has my highest respect. I am in total awe of God. That means what? God, I, am, I am in such an awe, in awe of God that I have put him as the top priority in my life, and I'm going to pursue God above all things. I'm going to pursue God over what culture says, what the TV says, what this says, what this person says. Me and my family, we're going to properly pursue God as the top priority in our life. And Joshua said, if you're going to choose for your house to serve the Lord, then you need to fear the Lord. That means I put him as the top priority in our lives. And the Bible says this. It says that the fear of the Lord is where wisdom begins. You want to be wise? Where does it start? Making God the top priority of your life. You want to be a wise person? A wise person has wise results. A foolish person has foolish consequences. We want to be a, wi a person of wisdom, not foolishness. Amen. Everybody say this, say, my mama, she didn't raise no fool. A foolish person has other things as the highest priority. A foolish family has all these other things that are higher than God. They put money over God. They put sports over God. They put all these other things over God, and it's confusing our children. Our children need to see that above all things, God is the highest priority. Scripture is the highest priority. The will of God, the ways of God, the word of God, we have exalted them as the highest priority in our lives. It's above all things. And if I asked everyone, what's the most important thing in your life, you all would say God, because that's the right answer. But how we live our lives, where we spend our money, where we spend our time, how we relate to things, what we really believe, that's how we prove if God is the top priority in our lives or not. So it's easy to say he is the top priority. But if we're going to have functional, successful families, it means he is the highest priority over our lives completely. And listen, I, I know what you might be thinking. You might be sitting here and, and you might be thinking a few things like this. I, I've really messed up the family thing. Or you know, I, I'm divorced, I'm on my own, or I'm not married yet. And so I'd like to explain to you that in 2021, family looks really different than it did back in the days of Leave it to Beaver. And it looks really different than it did way back in the days of Ozzy and Harriet. And the Bradys fixed everything in 30 minutes. That's not the real world we live in in 2021. So a lot of times when Pastor Diane and I will counsel people that are getting married or counseling marriages, we, I like to show them this, um, this pyramid. And so I, I, I want to I show you what, what family could be like. And this this triangle has God at the top, which means he is the highest of all priorities. This would be me, and this would be you, or this is what we would call a regular uh, nuclear family with God at the top and husband and wife here. And as long as husband and wife are continuing to pursue God as the top priority in their life, your families will be functional. Okay, or maybe your family looks a little bit like this. It was me and you, and now we have them. The them is those little people that you made or that you have brought into your family. So it's the same thing as if your family is just me and you, we pursue God. Or if we have some of the little ones with us, we especially are still what? Always pursuing God. In other words, here's what I'm saying. Your marriage will always work as long as you're both pursuing God. 
your family that now includes these children will always be successful. Guess what? As long as you are always pursuing God. And when I pursue, I say pursue God as a top priority, I mean his will, his word, and his ways are always what you're pursuing. See, with my wife, when we're always pursuing God, there are moments that I have realized that I'm not always right. That's the first thing you realize when you get married. You, you may have not been right about anything. Apparently, I don't know where to park. Or drive. It's just things I've learned over the years. Apparently, I needed help with these things. <laughs> but how many things can be fixed? Things can be successful. But the moment someone else stops pursuing God as a top priority, you stop going like this and you start going like this. It, 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 and, and maybe your family didn't fit into one of these triangles, but maybe, maybe, it, maybe this is the scenario that a lot of you have today. It's you with some them but the other person is no longer there. And you are a single mom or you are a single dad and you are navigating through life with children or a child. I want you to know that the pyramid still works. It's you taking those little ones and still pursuing God. See, the pursuit and the success of a family, no matter what it might look like, always depends on the pursuit of who? God. Or maybe you are a single person and there are no them, it's just you. I want you to know, no matter what your family pyramid looks like, the success is not in how many people are necessarily with you as much as who you're pursuing. It's properly pursuing God as the highest priority. And what does that look like? That looks like this, that the word of God, the will of God, and the ways of God is the priority of our lives. I love the Brady Bunch, but they're not the solution. The culture is not the solution. What has been broadcast into your life, or maybe the experiences that you've even gone through in your life, I want you to know no matter what all of those are or how they've happened or how we've failed, success is us continuing to pursue God. Someone say amen. amen. So if we're going to properly pursue, and this is the principle of, 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 of pursuit, it's a principle all throughout the Bible, that if you seek God, you will find him. And can I just interpret that to you? The intensity or the manner in which you pursue God or seek God is also the manner in which you'll find him. If you seek him casually, he'll be a casual God to you. If you seek him earnestly, he'll be an earnest God to you. It's this sowing and reaping thing. If you seek him with abandoning the rest of the world and other things, you will find him in your abandonment, and he will be all things to you. It's not only seeking him, it's the manner in which we seek him, that we find him. Life point number two. If we're going to pursue God properly, we not only pursue him as the top priority of our lives, we pursue him with all of our passion. With all of our passion. Verse 14 also says this. It says, serve him in sincerity and serve him in truth. Now, this word serve that Joshua gave means this, that you yield control and you obey him wholeheartedly, or that you obey him without hypocrisy, or in other words, it really literally means this, you stick to the directions he has given you. So if I'm going to make him the top priority in my life, I've also got to pursue him with my passion, and I'm going to stick to the instructions he gave me. I'm going to do it with all of my heart, not my opinions, but all of my heart. So what, what, what would that look like in our lives to really pursue God with all of our hearts? Because I'm telling you how to have a functional family in a dysfunctional world. Highest priority in all my passion or all my heart or all wholehearted pursuit of God. Well, I think that shows up in a few areas of our life. It should, first of all, show up in our homes. That's where it starts. Now, I want to just give this disclaimer. I have an awesome wife. We have an awesome marriage. I have awesome kids. I feel like I have an awesome family. But in our awesomeness, we are far from perfect. And sometimes we don't get it all right. We didn't get it all right in raising our kids. We didn't get it all right every day in and day out of relating with each other. But the one thing we keep doing is that we keep pursuing God, and we keep pursuing him with all of our hearts. 
And if you have figured it all out and you have done it all right, you can finish this series for me over the next few weeks. But I doubt that any of us have. And my wife always says this. The thing about Jesus is he can always redeem. Did y'all hear that? He can always redeem. He has the power of reversal. And what I mean by that is, even though we may have failed, made mistakes, had some blunders, had some failures, God has an amazing way of putting things back together, restoring, replacing, reprogramming, helping. That's the nature of God to be restorative. Has anyone ever experienced that? So that gives me hope for the days when my wife misbehaves. And I have to just bring up to her where she's misbehaving, where she's missed it. And obviously the day I do that is when I'm misbehaving, right? <laughs> so what does that look like? I asked my wife, I said, said, so if I said that we're to pursue God with all of our passion, and it, first of all, it shows up in our homes, what does that look like? And, and we both said this, it, it's how we pursue God at home, in front of our kids, with our kids. What does that mean? It's the atmosphere of our houses. And I, I've said this before, I don't know if I've said it recently, but how many of you think this is a good statement? We just want God to manifest. That means show up. How many of you want God to show up when we have a service? You want God to show up in your house. You want God to show up in your life. Here, here's what I realized. We can't make God show up. We are not in charge of God showing up. But there is one thing that we're in charge of, the atmosphere. Let me explain this. We are in charge of the atmosphere where God can show up. One thing God is not in control of is the atmosphere. So if we do this right, you and I create an atmosphere for God to feel welcome to show up, and God shows up. I can't make him show up, but I can be in charge of the atmosphere that makes him welcome to show up. He's not in charge of the atmosphere, but he's in charge of the showing up. So if my home can become an atmosphere where God feels welcome, if I can create an atmosphere where God is welcome in my house, with my kids and our family, that's my responsibility. If I can create that atmosphere in my own life, God will show up. The reason why we do services like we do on the weekend is we want to create an atmosphere for God to show up. I think God has showed up today. So how do you know? Did you feel him in worship? Did you sense him in worship? Are you being taught the word of God? Because when you teach the word of God accurately, God shows up. He's here right now. He, when I say certain things, he's going, knocking on your heart. He's just knocking. He's like, mm -mm -mm -mm. he's saying, huh, if you embrace that, it'll make you changes. You want to know how to do some things? Here it is. My word will correct. My word will direct. My word will heal. My word will expose. My word will conceal. My word will reveal. My word will restore. My, my word will equip. My word will encourage. Now, if you came here and I just beat you up and gave you your spiritual spanking all day and sent you home, that may not be the atmosphere of where God is. That is the atmosphere of religion. So if I said to you that your job is to go home this week and work on the atmosphere of your home, that might mean some things like this. The words we say, how we interact, what's on the TV, what's playing through the radio. Some of those things might need to be altered because it is in those little things that we do that allows God to show up in our house. That means spending some time with God, putting some worship music on watching something that encourages you, just creating an atmosphere in your home. Because here's what I know. My, my, my kids are old enough now. There are moments I'm like, those are Diane's kids. And then there are moments like, those are my kids. Sometimes you're thinking, what are they thinking? Why do they behave that way? Then you walk in the house and oosh, 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 worship music is blasting. Like, we did something right. The next day they have an attitude. And like, they're your kids. My point is, they're not perfect. But I do know this, they love God. And that's the best thing we could do as parents, is create an atmosphere where they've learned to love God. I also believe that this pursuing God with all of our hearts doesn't just show up at home. It shows up in us taking our families to church. Now let me stop and say something here. We have lived in a, a world for almost two years now where one of the most challenging things 
is when a government says you cannot gather and worship. Now we're to respect and honor government until they tell us things that are not biblical. Now we're never to be rebellious, but we're to take and stand for our rights. And I will tell you this, one of the most important, the Bible says this, when you see the days approaching, and the days aren't approaching, the days have approached, it says this, gather more, be together more, be together more as you see the days approaching. And I want to encourage you all with this, we're glad that when we had to take a little bit of time and go directly online, we have a good online presence. Um, I'm glad that this morning there are those who couldn't be with us for different reasons, that they're able to watch us online. But I want you to know that information online is not as transformational as you and I being in here together. And that's a tool that we will use, but our goal is not, no matter what happens around us, is not for everyone to watch online. Our goal, the Bible says, is come together. Something happens when we come together and we do church together and we're in here together, it does something. Because information alone online does not transform us. It doesn't change us. It can minister to us. But how we know when we're together and we're in God's house, something else happens. There's a, I heard Mark Driscoll say this this week. There's a difference between church and ministry. You can be ministered to online, but you can only have church in God's house. Amen. So, so coming together, bringing your kids, being in church together, that, that's us pursuing God with all of our passion. And, you know, we can pursue God in society, too. It, it's how we live our lives as a family. I want to encourage you, don't let culture tell you how to raise your kids. And don't let culture tell you how to do family. Because they don't have a clue. Get your clue from the Word of God. It will be transformational in your lives. Amen. Last life point is this, that not only do we pursue God by making Him the top priority, and we pursue Him with all of our passion, but we pursue God for our highest prior or our, our highest purpose so we've used these three words when I talk about pursuing how do we pursue God he's the top priority how do we pursue God with everything that is in our passion and how do we pursue God we make him the purpose of our lives verse 14 says this put away the gods of the culture that you worshiped on the other side of the river and what I mean by that it actually means this this is interesting but it means this to have honey without the wax in other words, what the Word of God and what Joshua was saying in his dying words was absolutely this. Have a pure pursuit of God. Make God the purest purpose of your life. Get away, put away all the other gods, all the other things of culture, all the other things of society. You've got to shelf those things, put those things away. They don't work. Use the Word of God to raise your kids. Use the Word of God to train up your kids. Use the Word of God to have a marriage. Use the Word of God to how you function in society. You, here's what I'm saying. The Word of God works. You won't go broke. You won't go defeated. You won't go divorced. Do y'all hear me? If, if, if the Word of God is your priority, your passion, and if it is your purpose. I want to close with this scripture. I know you know it, but this is the Hebrews, chapter 12 and verse 1. It says, as for us, sounds a little bit like the last thing they read. As for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. But as for us, we all have these great witnesses encircling us like clouds. That means there are those who've gone before. So we must let go, everyone say let go, of some wounds. No one to say. We have to let go of what? Every wound that has pierced us. And the sin that we easily fall into. Then we will be able to run life's marathon race with the passion we talked about, with the determination we're talking about, for the path has been already marked out before us. Now this scripture is an attitude scripture. It's talking about the attitude that you and I could and should have. It's this attitude of putting the things that weigh us down, taking it and pushing it far from us so we can run our race. Some of us are not being able to run our race because we're not pushing those things far from us. We're dragging them along behind us. We are dragging along behind us what has happened to us, 
who are what is coming against us we're dragging our failures we're dragging our baggage we're dragging and stumbling and bumbling when God says you got to take that stuff and push it far from you anyone got some stuff you might need to push far from you you might need to take your past push it far from you that past addi addiction push it far from you that past mistake come on push it far from you push that far from you y'all getting it it says that is the attitude that we have to have we got to take these things push them far from us and he explains these two things first of all he said take the wounds and that, the word for wound here means there's something that has pierced you it's an arrow and it's stuck in you and it's slowing you down it's uh, like a weight and especially when we're talking about family and relationship how I many there's nothing like family and relationship to wound you and we're walking around wounded instead of running forward as warriors and the Bible said we got to take those wounds and remove how do you remove them? you forgive somebody you forgive somebody because you're dragging you forgive somebody from yesterday you forgive somebody in the family you for, you got to forgive and the Bible says you got to let it and then he says not only the wounds but you got to push the sins that easily beset you and that can be just some sins you struggle with or literally it means you have to put doubt and unbelief far from you that's the sin that he's talking about and he says if you can put those things far from you and realize that there might be a tough road ahead of you but he has marked a path through it which is the Word of God then guess what you can do you can run your race you can run your marathon race I like that because how many know there's a difference between a sprint and a marathon a sprint is I got to go from point A to point B as fast as I can but if you thought life was a sprint you are sadly mistaken life is a marathon a marathon is an uh, is a distance marathon is a what endurance but he says the the way to successfully run your race and I'm gonna say it this way the, the way that you can successfully run your race is you've got to have grace in your race. And the Bible says his grace is always sufficient. So listen to me. No matter what your family experience has been, the family you grew up in, how functional or dysfunctional it may have been, I want to prophesy this to you. Yours can be different. Because God touches your yesterday with his grace, and he directs your tomorrow by his grace and what you need to finish your race is just his grace and the Bible says you need to take your faith and embrace the grace of God you say what do you mean by grace it just means the sufficiency of Jesus grace is the goodness of God the favor of God on your life you say well I don't deserve the goodness of God well, if you study the word grace and favor, it means that the goodness of God is unmerited, it is unearned, and it is absolutely undeserved. Now, if any of you in this room qualify by saying, I don't deserve it, I can't earn it, and I don't deserve it, would you raise your hands? That would be all of us. I don't deserve the goodness of God. I have goofed up, messed up, gotten off track, failed, especially maybe in relationship here's my word for you put those things behind you push them far from you push that dysfunction far from you that you may have been um, raised in push the dysfunction of your own um, me and my wife say this all the time no one gave us a workbook on how to do this our, our pre-marriage counseling was horrible two lives two different opinions until we said everything we need to figure this out is in this book and that's what works so we got to push are y'all getting what I'm saying you got to push some of these things far from you the doubt the unbelief the failure the wounds you got to push it far from you know that there are those circling around you they're behind you run your race take your family pursue the highest priority of the Word of God the ways of God the will of God do it with all of your heart and make it the purpose of your life that's what makes your life functional because I want you to hear this your marriage your life your family has a purpose 
no matter what your triangle looks like, it has a divine purpose. The book of Psalms says this, before you ever breathe, your days were written in a book. Psalm 139, verse 16. Our pursuit needs to be, God, what's in that book for my life? Who's the person I'm supposed to marry in that book? How am I supposed to do, raise my kids? How are we supposed to do this marriage thing? How am I supposed to do this single parenting thing? How am I supposed to do this? No matter what your triangle looks like, there's the goodness, there's the grace of God, there's the word of God, there's the direction of God for your life. Listen, with that, none of us should stand here and say we're dysfunctional. And none of us should stay here and say, I, I, I'm at a disadvantage. Because the grace of God is your advantage, and the word of God is how we function. We want to build functional families no matter what your triangle looks like. Are y'all getting me today? Are you feeling me today? No matter what your triangle looks like. If it's just you and God, it doesn't mean you're dysfunctional. If it's you and God and her and them, the only thing that makes you dysfunctional is what you're pursuing and how you're pursuing it and what's become the purpose of your life. Look at someone and say, that's good right there. Somebody get something good out of this this morning. So I want us to I want us to stand for just a moment before we do a closing song. And I just want you to think for a moment before we rush out of here and move on with the rest of our week. And we're going to build on this next week and the next week. And I'm going to share with you over the next few weeks, guys, how do you work in this triangle? Ladies, how do you work in this triangle? Kids, how do you work in this triangle? How we protect ourselves. We're going to deal with all that. But I want you at this moment to just close your eyes for a moment. And I want you to think about the things I said today. And only you know how functional or dysfunctional an area of your life might be. And only you and God know what it is that you need to rearrange, repent of, restructure, rebuild, remodel. And only you know the things I said today, what you need to grab a hold of and say, I need to let God work that out in my life this week. Maybe you realize there's a lot of things in life and God in your brain is number one, but in function maybe he isn't. Or maybe you've been serving him with like a certain capacity, but not all of your heart. Or maybe he's not the total purpose of your life. Or maybe you were like that last scripture. There's some arrows stuck in you or some doubt and unbelief that God could bring you through it, turn you around, and get you across the finish line. And maybe there's something or someone you just need to forgive and let it go. That someone could be yourself. close with a song and if you are standing with some of your family you might want to grab their hand grab their arm maybe there's a friend around you we're gonna close this portion of a service out by singing this together making this our our declaration making this our our prayer this morning Let's worship as the band leads us, and I'll be back up in just a moment to, to, to close this out. Isn't God's word good? Just to think. Okay, no one's looking. How many would say, man, I, I, I just know this, the family thing, I've, I've erred in some areas. 
Isn't it good to know today, though, that because God is for us and not against us, sometimes it's just a few heart adjustments, and it gets us right back in our lane. Isn't it cool? God just corrects us, redirects us like that. And I feel like there are a few people that need to hear what I'm about to say. And I will say, thus saith the Lord with this. Your failure is not fatal unless you let it be. Your failures are not fatal unless you let them be. As long as you're breathing and the word is working and it's alive, change is possible. Healing is possible. Redemption, restoration. It's not only possible, it's probable. Failure isn't fatal when God's involved. Sure. 
Let us pray for you. Father, I thank you for all these men and women, young men and women. No matter what their family triangle looks like, God, I pray there'd be a spirit of pursuit on them. They wouldn't be altered off their course by anything they've done or what's happened to them or the world around them. But God, they would alter their course by your words. Pray they'd have a spirit of faith, a spirit of agreement, and a spirit of pursuit that would make their families top-notch and completely functional. God, we delete the dysfunction from our lives. We push it far from us, and we go after you with all of our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Just a couple of quick reminders, too. Um, as in church news, remember this coming Wednesday is our first Wednesday service. We have prayer at 615 right here in the auditorium. And our service begins at 7. And we're doing things in reverse. in reverse. And we will have coffee and donuts. So make sure you come out for that. We're excited to be with you on Wednesday night, too. It's a great refreshing time, too, in the middle of our week. So make sure you come out for that. If you are a guest, once again, thank you for being with us. Please stop by our connection area. We have a gift for you. And if you need prayer for anything, when we dismiss, we have a uh, our prayer workers that will be up front here, and they would love to pray for you, your family. Uh, please avail yourself to them. Turn to someone and say, that was awesome. You are dismissed.